G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. Age 42 in 2003, Patrice left a long-standing engineering career to start an environmental consulting firm. Starting as the one FTE for the first five years, they peaked at 40 in 2011, then after a downturn in the Australian coal industry, dropped to 12 and now have 32 FTE across five locations. Believes you should act quickly, funded the business with only $20,000 of her own capital to start, the rest has been from cash flow, felt they had succeeded when, about 18 months ago, beat a large competitors with over 10,000 staff for many projects. Hardest thing about growing a small business is just starting, having that confidence to just do it and being prepared to make mistakes. Advice Patrice would give herself on day one is, don't sweat the small stuff, embrace mistakes, just have a go and trust yourself. Check out episode 31 with Christina from Thank You Payroll, a business with a nice social bent. In 10 years, they went from 5 FTE to over 18 and have processed more than $2 billion of payroll in New Zealand. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Patrice Brown from CQG Consulting in beautiful, sunny, warm Queensland, as opposed to very cold, windy, wet Hobart. Thanks for your time today, Patrice. Hi, Troy. Great to be here. Let's start with how we know each other. That's another easy one. Peter, our podcast editor, reached out and got in touch. Um, I gave him a goal to we want to even the numbers up by Christmas time this year and have 50% female entrepreneurs or business owners on the cast. So hence I've had about, I've had a shit ton <laughs> drop in my calendar in the last week. I've had about 20 female uh, interviews coming up, all dropping in. So Peter's done a great job there. Um, uh, please stop now, Peter, because <laughs> otherwise we're booked up till Christmas. So thanks for coming on and responding to Peter's um, um, email. Great. I'm sure your life's changed for the better, Troy. I don't think we're token females. I think you'll find that the uh, females are probably some of the best entrepreneurs in Australia. So great part of it. Yeah, he's fa- he's found some great ones, actually, um, um, all of the ones that I've, I've looked at at the moment, which is good. And uh, I'm not averse to surrounding myself with strong and successful females, that's for sure. Well, let's tell our audience a bit about your business, um, where it's located, what it does and how it makes money. Yeah, sure. So uh, I do have a couple of businesses. CQG Consulting is the main one. It's an environmental consultancy business with our head office here in uh, Rockhampton Mm -hmm. in central Queensland. We have five uh, locations spread out across Queensland with a real focus on regional areas. Um, Started in 2003 and... We provide environmental advice for existing businesses and industry and also for developers. So if someone wants to, say, build a new tourism resort or a new smelter, we work with the design teams to reduce the environmental footprint and take them through and look after the environmental approvals right through to their operations. So I guess in the last 17 years, with a lot more focus on the environment and cleaning things up and being safe, et cetera, for the environment, I'm guessing Mm. demand for your services would have really increased over those 17 years? Yeah, it's increased. And interestingly enough, it changed. It's changed as well and it continues to change. A lot of it's driven by compliance. Uh, Compliance is important and Australia boasts some of the most beautiful natural environment we have in, in the world. Uh, We also have challenges, though, with some of our fauna species. We do have weeds. uh, We've got pest animals. We've got the Great Barrier Reef that we need to protect. There's also globally concerns about climate change and also the communities in general, Troy, sort of also concerned about their own health with environmental health, with noise, air, odour. And it's a change in sort of sea. So we are in demand. Yeah. Yeah, great. That's really good. And so the business model is, is it um, purely a consulting, like an hourly basis that you effectively charge your clients? It's it's probably, a, it's a mixture and it's had to be a mixture because we are based in regional areas. We've got long term established relationships with clients. So for some clients, we're on retainers. Yep. Some of them's hourly basis. Some of them will ask us to help them out with a project and we work just for that project. Some of those projects go for some years. So it's a real mix depending on clients' needs. Yeah, great. Okay. And how did you start out um, back in 2003? Like what, how did the idea come about and how did you fall into this? 
Yeah, great question. My original uh, start in my career was in the sugar industry and then moved into the timber industry with CSR and that was back in the late 90s when environmental protection in Australia was becoming more of a thing and then there was challenges in the timber industry with uh, logging and also green, pro green groups and protesters and so it was a a realisation there needed to be a raising of awareness of what industry and businesses were doing to protect the environment. So I spent about 13 years working in the industry, then went into uh, work in the Environment Protection Agency for a short period of time and got into consulting. So I worked in some of the big consult two big consulting firms in Queensland, uh, probably for about six or seven years, and then went over and worked for a company that was going to build an aluminium smelter down near Gladstone. Did that for a short period of time. Then I had a lot of my clients that I'd uh, connected with when I was in the big consulting firms asking for me to help out with their projects. So I took the bold leap and decided to start my own business in 2003. Great. And can I ask, what, uh, how old were you when you made that jump in 2003? I was 32, which I look back now and think that was young. At the yeah. time, I thought, am I too old to do it? You know, it's one of those times, I think, in life. It's just when the, when the time is right. <clears throat> I did have a young family at that stage. I had finished my uh, studies. Um, I studied engineering and science remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was about the right time. You know, I had a young family. When is the right time? It's, 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 a, it's always a hard decision to make, but it worked out. It was the right time for me. So, Yeah. <laughs> Great. And do you have any key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business over those 17 years? Yeah, I think at consulting, probably the numbers to use is probably the number of people, the full-time equivalents that you have working for you. So for the first five years, I was a sole trader. Yep. And it was during that time that I was managing some big projects in New South Wales and Queensland. And I was having to draw on other sub-consultants and bringing people in on contract. So I decided to sort of, again, branch out and employ people. So it was about 2008, I decided to employ others. Uh, by 2011, the company was up to 40 people. Wow. So it grew, grew very rapidly. Yeah. And that, that was on the back of uh, the growth phase in Queensland. The mining sector was booming. Uh, there was a whole host of things going on at that stage. Um, at one stage, we were project managing four major environmental studies in Queensland, more than even the big consultancies that we were competing with. Wow. So it was, it was boom, 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 and then Bust. almost <laughs> over. <laughs> um, almost overnight, uh, the coal industry you know, had a big downturn that um, I guess was, was unexpected um, for many. And also we had some of our projects sort of wrap up. There was a change of government in Queensland that saw uh, some of the projects and things um, put on ice. Um, so it wasn't bust, but it certainly knocked us around. We went, I went from 10 years in business, uh, making a profit every month, yeah. have never, bor never borrowed money in the business, have never been in the red. Um, so after those 10 years of having a wonderful time of growth, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then, then had 10 months of just watching that bank balance. <laughs> <laughs> Dropped Drop. out. Yeah. So that that was hard. That was hard. It, it wasn't the hardest time of my business, but it was a real challenge. And what I sort of learned from that experience, I guess, is to um, to, to act a little bit more quickly. Uh, and also, we decided to diversify the management team. We looked at it and said we were too much in the greenfield side of things. We had moved away from our our um, what we call you know boots on the ground type work. The, you know, the basic work with environmental monitoring and those sort of things. So that's when we decided to, we did retrench five staff and we didn't replace staff over time. So we ended up getting back down to about 12 staff in uh, early 2015. So it was a big, big up and a big yep. down. Yep. And now we're back, back up to about 23 full-time staff and probably about another 20 casuals, permanent part-timers. So. so what rolls up to about 30, 32 FTA now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's great. That oh. number. And that's a good solid number for us. Yeah, that's great. And I was going to ask, so the GFC didn't really have a direct impact on, it was more the, the shifting of the, the coal industry, the change there that was the impact, not the GFC? Yeah, that's right. And I think that was pretty typical for regional Queensland. It's not, we weren't just working for coal clients, uh, but the civil contractors, the councils, there's so many businesses throughout uh, regional Queensland that were affected by that downturn mm -hmm. and uh, the flow on effects that sort of came, came through from that. 
Yeah, great. And when was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? Uh, there's been a few moments like that in life. I guess it's a few moments you think oh, I've failed and a few moments you think I've succeeded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose just recently we had... Um, uh, we were successful in securing a contract, when I say recently, about 18 months ago, for the Department of Defence with uh, working for Lang O'Rourke at Shellwater Bay for the Australia-Singapore Military Training Initiative to um, to conduct the environmental package. That's a package that goes over a couple of years. We were competing against, it got down to three consultancies. Uh, the other two were foreign-owned consultancies with between 10,000 and 20,000 employees mm. and we were yeah. successful in securing the contract. Yeah. So that was the moment um, That was the moment you felt that uh, I felt some success. There's also, I suppose, there's other moments in uh, 2015, 2017 and recently last year after natural disasters in Queensland, our team um, has sort of set us, we've set ourselves up so we'll go out and help councils with recovery after natural disasters. Mm -hmm. It's always a moment of satisfaction and success when you see those projects sort of roll out and people's waste is collected and you know, council staff are happy with your performance. We yep. felt success with those, those moments too. Yeah, great. Well, uh, next question was, what does success look like to you? Success, and it's both, you know, as you go through life, you do measure it quite differently as yes. what success. I think when we, when we're young, we're looking for the holy grail that we think is all about power and ego and money. Yeah. And I, th I think there's that, there's that moment in life, and I don't know when that moment happens. Maybe it's around 45. Maybe it's milestones and triggers in people's life. I don't know when it was. But probably for me, it was probably in my mid-40s when you have that realisation the holy grail is time. Mm, we're only here for such a short period of time in life. Yep. And so success, success for me personally is having uh, – I think I read somewhere recently, if you're looking at a career side of things, if you're doing something you love with the people you like, the way you want, and, you know, jumping out of bed every day and really being passionate about what's on for the day ahead is, is success to me. It's really looking forward to the day ahead. And then going home at night and being able to put your head on the pillow and feel good about what you did. You're not going to tick off all the things on your list, but just feeling good that you had a good crack. Yeah, that, I can't remember who said it, but uh, if you choose a job that you love, you never work a day in your life. Yeah, that's that's it. And of course, we all have those frustrating days, but many yeah. more better ones. Yeah. Uh, what about number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast-growing business? Marketing, I think, is really targeting. You can spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, sort mm. of being splatter gun. Um, I think some people put, you know, for our business, it's not necessarily going to be putting a lot of effort into things like Facebook and those sort of social platforms. It might be you know, LinkedIn and some of those other ones are probably more um, likely to be successful for us. So it's really understanding who you are targeting. I remember a marketing fellow in Rockhampton, Jason Foss, once told me, just pretend you're looking at that person that you're wanting to market to yep. and that person changes over time. Who I was marketing to back in 2010 is a different person who I'm marketing to in 2020. So have that agility but really target it. That's good, and that's good advice, and I totally agree with that. I, we certainly did that early on in my career. We were just uh, trying to be all things to all people, and you, yeah, you're much better to niche down and, and focus and be very targeted. Definitely. And so funding your business, did, did you end up ever having to take on bank debt or investors or government grant? You got through that, that tough cash flow time? So, yeah, I think that was, that was one of the benefits, I think, starting up uh, in my early 30s. But having said that, I think, you know, for starting a business, um, you know, my, my daughter's just sort of started her own sort of small business with photography. I think it's just starting, and it's, yep. but it's making sure you don't overcommit. So for me, it was an easy thing. I was 32. I'd had a good career, so I had probably $20,000 there to start off my business yep. and have a look back. Yeah, great. Well done. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? I would because I've got an absolute love for protecting the environment and the work that we do. With We do a lot of work with Aboriginal groups throughout yeah. Queensland as well. It's a very rewarding yeah. uh, industry to be in and I really do love it. So I would, I'd do it again. Yeah, both important parts uh, to work in, obviously, the environment and uh, the, the Aboriginals as well. So, yeah, that's good. Uh, can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so far so our audience can learn from it? Uh, the most stressful point that I probably wasn't prepared for and no one ever is, we're a small team and unfortunately we had one of our beautiful staff members, Ange, who um, at the age, she was just over 30, 31, with young children, um, she had bowel cancer 
mm. diagnosed and uh, she died within a very short period of time. She was fit. Um, she was still coming to work only about a month before she passed away. Mm. Um, so that was something in, in my business, it, it, like anything, it really, but because we're a small company, it's like a family, I didn't feel like coming to work. And, you know, at that time we lost staff. We, a number of the staff had never known anyone that had, had died that were close to them. So yeah. they didn't want to come to work. So it was a big turnover in a short period of time. So very personal one, that one, but that was the toughest time yeah. in the business. Wow, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Wow. But her, her her memories and her inspiration and her energy was something that we all talked about and we sort of, you know, quite regularly speak about and I think it's helped underpin the success of the business going forward. Yeah, good. Thanks. Good to hear. And what area in business do you feel you had to work on the most to add the greatest value? The toughest, I've found one of the toughest areas in a small business, particularly if you're engaging, um, you, you have staff and you're relying on staff to be able to help deliver your product and deliver your services. To be able to really invest in ensuring you have the right staff, recruiting slowly, making sure it's a good cultural fit. They don't all have to be the same, yep. but to have the staff that are going, you just need that one rotten tomato in the mix or one, <laughs> and they can, they can change things. So that's probably been the toughest. I didn't appreciate that. In the early days, I thought it was as simple as reading a CV, interviewing someone, put them on board, but it's much more than that, much more complex. It's more about the individual. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's extremely difficult. Uh, I do think it's under resource in a lot of small businesses. People don't give it the time or investment of knowledge in recruitment. And it's such an important mm. thing. It's obviously, it's the gatekeeper to getting A players on the bus. Um, and as Mark from Manager Tools talks about, he, he bangs on and says that it's the most important thing a manager does is recruitment. Because you, if you start yep. with a B or a C player or a rotten egg or rotten tomato, like you said, it's just a world of pain. And there's a lot of surveys that show miss hire can cost about 10 times their salary yep. in, in, you know, lost productivity, A players leaving, got to replace them, et cetera. It's, you know, it's phenomenal. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a big one. It's also that uh, touch point with your staff as well and, and the mentoring and, it, yeah, it's, it's probably the toughest part. Yeah. And what have you enjoyed least about managing the fast growth? Uh, managing, um, I suppose, in the fast, when fast growth is happening, it's also the same sort of time that other industries have, um, are also growing very fast. And I suppose for us in regional areas, there's been losing staff is always a tough one. So it's very hard to compete sometimes with some of these big mining companies and others who pay an enormous amount of money, albeit people were, you know, having to relocate and work in remote areas. So I've really, every time a staff member leaves, it feels like a stab in the heart. You know, yeah. someone who's who you've mentored and you've you've trained and you've really invested time in, and often people just don't get it. Like they'll just put a bit of paper and said, "I'm going to leave in a month's time." You know, and it really is just absolutely crushing. Yeah. When, when that happens, but you're also very proud of a lot of your staff going on and doing bigger and better things. You can't. It's like children when you raise them. You can't hold them forever. But I'm sort of hoping with <laughs> I'm hoping with the team we've got now that they can sort of take the business forward. Yeah. Same sort of vision, dreams. Great. And what do you love most about growing a small business? It's that personal satisfaction of in particularly in regional areas and being able to offer a, a career pathway for young mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Find it really rewarding to watch their careers develop and also the relationships we have with our clients. Yeah. And, you know, even challenging times, be able to have, have a problem and, and develop solutions together is really rewarding. Yeah, when I was in London in 2006 for about four years, my business partner and I over there, we had an IT support company and we started a social enterprise on the side to help young people get on the career ladder for IT because chicken and egg, you need experience yeah. really to start and where, where can they get experience? And because the borough that we, our business was in, we were in shortage and it, was, it had the highest youth unemployment rate in the UK. So it was 33%. Nice. One, one third of the youth were unemployed and... Uh, so we, we got a lot out of, um, mm. out of that and we found some great uh, uh, technicians that ended up working for the main business as well out of, out of that, uh, that social enterprise and we were able to place other great people into, into other careers and it's very satisfying to be able to help people with that pathway. Oh, that would be fantastic. It's a life changer. You would have changed people's lives doing that. Yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. Mm. And what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Probably the big mindset, um, sorry, the mindset change <laughs> is probably when you first when you first sort of start out, you often sort of think it's about the technical ability, it's about the branding, it's about your logo, it's about your website. It's it's all those things you can sort of really sort of focus on. 
And again, it's that realisation, that moment in time where you think, hey, that's not it. What people have come into us for is for this personalised service, coming up with practical solution. It's your team. It's the human side of it. And I think when you have that realisation, it really is quite a, it, it, it's a boost of confidence, but then it also helps you refocus, well, what is really important here? Of course, you've got to have all those other bits and pieces for a successful business, but you can have the best logo and the best website and all those sort of things. But if you're not answering your phone, if you're not coming back and looking after the people the way they expect and providing value for money, well, it's not going to, it's going to be worthless. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Yeah, if you've got someone that answers the phone that gives a really shitty first impression, then, yeah, that lets the whole thing yeah, down. Yeah, it's all gone. Yeah. That's it. What's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? And this is probably one you'll get from a lot of the female entrepreneurs is to be able to survive yep. <laughs> in the world of business as an entrepreneur, particularly if you've got family members and you've got other responsibilities outside the business, is to look after yourself without yep. a doubt. It's making sure you're getting that massage every couple of weeks. It's making sure you go to the gym. It's making sure you have time for coffee with friends. It's having time out and booking that in your calendar and making sure it happens. Yeah, absolutely. And getting quality sleep. I'm a big advocate these days of you know eight hours sleep. I used to only sleep about four hours a night thinking that yep. you know, pure uh, brute force was the way to success and it's not. No. Uh, and sleep is just so important. And yeah, I think you're right, uh, uh, you know, looking after yourself and you've got to invest that time and go out of your way because I've said this before, it can be quite addictive to be doing something you love doing and having yeah. so much creative freedom and control and flexibility, but mm. you've got to, you know, stop and go and do other things, Have a, make sure you've got a hobby as well. That's right, because we are only here for that short time. Yeah. Do you love talking small business growth with other owners? We have a vibrant online community from many industries around the world. Plus, we regularly add new tools and resources for community members and host two webinars a month to help you grow your small business. GrowSmallBusiness.com uh, Can you talk about how you added people to the team, some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? Uh, adding people to the team, I think some of the mistakes I've made is relying on um, interviewing people over <laughs> over Zoom or Skype and not meeting them face to face. And I know that it's a challenge at the moment with COVID, and so that's a, it's that extra sort of care we need to take and making sure we're doing the reference checks and really going into, and not sticking with with your gut feel. There's been times when I've recruited people and there's just been something that hasn't felt right, yeah. and I've gone ahead and recruited because their their CVs were impressive. And, you know, as a result, I've lost other staff because they weren't, they weren't the right fit. Yep. Yep. No, I totally agree with that. And what are some things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? I think it's not, micro, it's not micromanaging people. <clears throat> it's allowing innovation, um, allowing, fostering, encouraging innovation. And it's also just to be embracing that agility and thinking outside the square every day with your staff and people that are coming to work and your clients. And now again, with our, as we talked about before with COVID, it's, it's provided an opportunity for us to have time to sort of stop and think about how we do things, how we might do things better and continually, continually asking yourself every day and your staff and your team, can we do it better? Can we do it smarter? And sometimes it's just simple things that can make a huge difference. If you do that and you can bring that culture and care and that kindness into the way you do business, it just makes for a really strong, as you say, kick-ass team. Yeah, definitely. And I've seen other other business owners and managers try and manage with fear and not be inclusive um, and mm -hmm. it just doesn't work. It might work short term, but, uh, you know, valuing your team's opinion, getting them involved in decision-making and in, in, they, they feel really valued and, and engaged as well. Yeah, yeah. That's the way to go. <clears throat> so being an ex-engineer, I guess, or studying engineering, uh, professional development I, I'm guessing is something you carried through to your business career like you did you invest much professional development in books podcasts courses training conferences or anything like that when you were starting yep. Mm. Um, yep. I was lucky enough to grow up in a remote cattle property in regional Queensland I was studying correspondence so when the time came to go to boarding school albeit with those experiences that go with it not always nice yep. um, I always had a great thirst for knowledge and it was always a privilege and it was really ingrained into me when I was by, my, by both my parents that to have an education was a real privilege. So I was like one of those nerdy kids that had a little chemistry book beside my bed and used to listen to the ABC with my dad on the news and those sort of things. So 
learning absolutely every day. I mean, I, my kids call my, my kids say to me, "Mum, you're a loser." I think I spent thirty years studying. I did my I worked full time from when I was seventeen years old because um, I was wanting to make money. But I also studied externally, so I did a sugar chemistry. A diploma, then did a chemistry degree, and then I did a master's in civil engineering, and I've done a whole bunch of other courses and things since then. Absolutely loved, and I have a great passion for learning. And I'm fortunate that the people that work for me, people in our team, also have that same passion for learning, and we really need to. I mean, every day, and things continue to change, so sometimes that learning is different now. It may not be a formal course. It might be just simply reading articles on LinkedIn or picking up a book or sharing listening to podcasts like yours, yep. Troy, it's it, continual learning. Yeah, it's I agree. It's part about life. And it's important investment because otherwise you stand still, you don't adapt and change or you don't see new trends coming. Uh, you need to That's pivot it. for, yeah. Yeah. Um, have you had any mentors or coaches along the way you can talk to? Always had mentors. Um, and I think this is something that, you know, personally I sort of reached out for and searched for in life. Now, those mentors in life are both, uh, older people, people in my same sort of age group, and younger people. And I think that's one of the things too. People often think a mentor has to be someone that's in your same career or has got the degrees and things that you're looking for. I mean, I would say, you know, my, my parents were both wonderful mentors for me. My grandmother was a great mentor. I've got some uh, clients now that are really great friends of mine that are mentors. Um, I've also got some wonderful friends, Aboriginal friends, um, that I've developed some really strong relationships with, that they have so much knowledge about country and protection of country that I wasn't aware of. Uh, and also just my, my kids, they're great mentors. Yep. <laughs> they sort of straighten you out, you know, when, you, when you're sort of going down the, ro the wrong track. So yeah. I think it's, um, yeah, you can have formal mentors and, you know, it, it sort of just shifts around. Sometimes you need mentors for different reasons and, and hopefully I think in those, in those discussions you can sort of, exchanging some ideas as a mentor yourself with those relationships yeah that's good and it sounds like you you know your ego's in check it's pretty healthy you're open to listening to anyone and take what value you can from what they've got to say and i think that's holds uh, any business owner in good stead if they've got that attitude yeah you can't get too full of yourself particularly <laughs> in regional quick particularly in regional areas you'd be no you'd be no sorted out yeah. pretty quick I think we suffered a bit of hubris at the start of our career, business career, and we paid for it. We were a bit too uh, oh. arrogant for with a few things and exuberant, but um, yeah, that comes come wisdom comes with age, I think, and mistakes. It does. Shit ton of, shit yeah, ton of mistakes. mistakes. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And, yeah. and do, you, do you have a board of advisors or a board directors? I don't in the company. I'm fortunate enough to have held various board roles over time, and I'm on the Sikh University Council at the moment. Uh, have been for the last sort of five years and it's sort of in those sort of forums I guess where the strategic planning and discussions and things that we're sharing ideas I have been valuable back into my own business um, on the I've got a, another business Tuna Bar which is 50% owned by CKG and 50% owned by the Drumble people the traditional owners in the uh, Rockhampton region we've been going for about 12 months and we've got a board of directors for that in CKG consulting we have a management team yep. that we um that um, we meet monthly and that is a very important group that we sort of toss around ideas, what we're we doing wrong, how can we improve things. So, yeah, definitely you can't do it on your own. You haven't got all the answers. Yeah, no, I've come to the last five or ten years, I guess, to really appreciate the value of good corporate governance. So shareholders appoint a board, the board appoints a, a leader of the business, whether it's the CEO or MD, and, and then you've got a management yeah. team around that. It's just so important. Yeah, great mechanism. Mm. Yeah, it is. All right, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? The hardest thing in growing a small business is probably for many people is just starting. It's just having that confidence to just, don't, just do it and get yep. into it. Yep. I think then is, is, is a path, it's a pathway and being prepared to make mistakes. And as you said before, Troy, you need to make mistakes to grow. And I think sometimes, well, certainly early in my business growth, was I'd really beat myself up for mistakes and really sort of, I didn't really dwell on, but it was one of those things that I don't dwell on it so much now when we make mistakes. And you know what? We make mistakes every day. Yeah. That, every day there's a mistake we make. I agree. And things. Yeah. I, I did that as yeah. well. I was quite critical of myself for early on uh, for, you know, some business is not working and, but you've mm. just got to accept that and, and take what you can from it into the next chapter. That's right. And just so, and that's one of the things I think with, with, with young and new staff too is, is encouraging people to share those mistakes. It's not yep. a, and trying to get a, not having a blame culture. 
yeah. but hey, this is, sometimes it's good to make a mistake because it might save your life, save someone else's life, or we won't make it again with, the, with how we do our business. Yep. Yeah, it sounds like you've carried great humility into the culture as well. So it's, it's very open for people to say, um, like uh, I've had people say to me, uh, well, that's a fucking stupid idea. <laughs> Even though maybe they're technically their boss, but, you know, yeah. we have a joke about it, but, you know, I'm, I, that, that's the way it needs to be. Otherwise, uh, yeah, you can be blinded by your ego and go about and make silly decisions. Yeah, no, it's great. And it's good if you've got that culture that people are brave enough to say that to you as well. Yeah, the, um, uh, the other day, uh, the, I chair a brewery, uh, the second largest brewery here in Tasmania, and the other day the, our general manager sent me an email to a response to one of my emails and then later in the morning rang me about something else and he said, oh, by the way, that email, that uh, I could have summed that up for you uh, more succinctly. It wasn't a, a, that long of an email, so but I knew where he was going with this. So he said... <laughs> With two words. I could have just used two words. And I, I said, what's that, Greg? And he said, fuck off. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, leave me be to do my job. And I said, yes, I know. I'm sorry. I got a little bit operational there. And I thought after I sent the email, I shouldn't have sent it. So and next time, just send me those two words. Don't need to explain. That's it. My, you know, I'm not going to be offended. I've got a pretty thick skin. So okay. yeah, it's good to have a joke no, and, and be that. No, open. it is. That's right. What about favourite business book which has helped you the most? Um, trusted Advisor. By David Meister, that's how yeah, you pronounce it. That's a great Love that book. book. It's a great mm. book, and the one before that is managing a professional services firm. I assume you read that one as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah that was great too. David yeah. H. Meister, yeah, it's a great mm. couple of books, and Trusted Advisor is a good follow-up. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah, it's just a great read. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Oh, it's probably a mixture. You know, interesting enough, it's probably because I'm working in that professional field so much. Um, it's probably the ones that are the well, the wellness type ones and the meditation type ones. I probably get a lot out of those and using that opportunity when you're on, not that I'm flying so much anymore, but on planes and those sort of things, it's just sort of hone in and listen to those. I think it's, you know, like a lot of people in um, in, the, in business, I've always got a bunch of books beside my bed that are half read. <laughs> Me um, too. Some you go back to. <laughs> <laughs> you think, yeah, you know, what's that page? You go back into that yeah. and, you, and you mark things off. So it's, um, yeah, it's probably a mixture. And sometimes it's just those simple ones of, you know, how to recruit staff or some of those LinkedIn articles. I get a lot out of those as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm starting to get into LinkedIn now as well, which is good. But yeah, it's great with Audible now these days and the Amazon app, the Kindle app, you mm. can read and it remembers where you were, et cetera. And uh, podcasts, yes. I, I, it's just great. I can multitask, I can be driving. Mm. Uh, you know, a long car drive or a bushwalk or cleaning the house. I, I, I love it. Yeah, no, it's wonderful, wonderful tools. Uh, one tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? One tool you recommend? Well, it's, an, it's probably one of those things. It's a tool. I think, I think it's your internal tools. So I yep. think using your – so without going out there for the silver bullet to say, is it an app, is it a laptop, is it a flash building, is it whatever it is, it's your own core belief in yourself. So mm-hmm. I think the best tool you've got is yourself. And I think it's just going back and, and being able to admit mistakes, have humility, and, yeah. and when you've got the opportunity, just walk, go walking in the bush and just sort of reinvent things in your mind, but appreciate yourself. You're yeah. your best tool. Yeah, no, that's good advice. Very good. And finally, my favourite question, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Day one from starting out, if I was doing it again, it would be don't sweat the small stuff. Um, and embrace mistakes yeah. and just have a go. Yeah. Have a go. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and trust and trust in yourself because people come to you because of you. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice. And fantastic. Well done, Patrice. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. I think the audience get a lot of value out of your journey and, and what you shared with us. Uh, incredible growth starting as you, you know, one person show for five or six years and up to 40 people down to 12 and then now back up to around the 30 mark FTE. That's wonderful growth in, in a very important and exciting area of business as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. We're very excited about our tuna bar business as well. So whilst we've got growth over here in CKG world, uh, we've also got this other business that we're working together in with yep. developing uh, young Aboriginal people in the region with their capacity and skills. So we're excited about the future. Yeah, great. Else. I might have to have you on next year maybe to talk about that and how that's going. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you, Troy. It's been thank lovely having a chat. Great. Thanks, Patrice. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.